Good, after, good evening, everybody. And you're all so welcome to join us on our webinar entitled A Woman's Place in the Home During COVID-19. On behalf of the IWLA, we are thrilled to see so much interest in this topic for discussion this evening. My name is Cathy Smith, I'm a barrister and I am the Vice Chairperson of IWLA. We have over 200 people who registered to attend this evening and as I said, I think that is indicative of the level of interest in this important uh, discussion. I'm going to give you a brief overview of what we're going to deal with in the webinar. We have three fantastic speakers and we will also be having a question and answer session at the end. The speakers will take approximately an hour and we have 30 minutes at the end for questions and answers and comments that you may wish to make. We will probably all be familiar at this stage with the Q&A um, section of Zoom and you're invited to uh, submit any questions that you would like to put to the panel or as I said any comments that you may wish to make. You may wish to make a contribution so please feel free to use the Q&A function throughout the presentation. My colleague uh, Fiona McNulty is going to be monitoring those questions and at the end of each of the three speakers, sorry, at the end of all of the three speakers, uh, we'll go to Fiona to go have a look at um, the questions and the comments that have been made this evening. As I said, I'm just going to give a, an overview of what we're going to discuss. This is all about Article 41.2 of the Constitution, but we deliberately centred it in the context of COVID-19 and the fact that so many of us are confined, if I can use that word, to our homes at the moment. That is, of course, if we are lucky enough to have a home. We deliberately placed the, the wording of Article 41.2 in the waiting room so that people could have a look at it at the start of this evening's webinar. Most of us, well, a large majority of the people who have registered for the event are lawyers. And I assume that like me, we would have read this article probably for the first time as part of our legal education. And it's quite likely that it hasn't really cropped up very much in our professional lives and possibly even less in our personal lives. And for me, not having read this for quite a long time, having sat down and looked at it again, the language is to me quite shocking and it always shocks me. And that's one of the reasons we placed it there um, at the start so everybody could have a look at it. Now, as I said, we've deliberately um, centered the conversation this evening around the fact that we are um, all operating within the COVID-19 restrictions. And as I said, our homes, are, 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 our homes have taken a different role in our lives right now. Our homes may be safe places, they may not be safe places. We have different roles within our homes and those roles and duties, and I'm taking the language from the article here, are under the spotlight in a way in which they have probably never been before. Some of us are parents and carers of others. Some of us are not. Some of us are women, some of us are men. And it seems to us like this is a new opportunity to have a look at what this article might mean at, in this time when we have a new relationship with our home. Now, in terms of our speakers, about 18 months ago, the Irish Women Lawyers Association decided to have a serious look at Article 41.2. And the first thing we did was we commissioned research from Anne Conlon Barrister. And Anne is going to speak to us. She's going to be our first speaker this evening. And she's going to outline the legal position in relation to the article. In understanding it, we needed to look to the past and to look at how it operates in the present. And I'm delighted that my colleague, Rosemary Hayden Solicitor, um, also a committee member on the Irish Women Lawyers Association, as is Anne Conlon, and Rosemary is going to speak to us this evening about that historical context to understand why it made its way into the Constitution in the first place. And then she's going to have a look at how it operates within our lives today and with a particular focus on our lives within the COVID-19 restrictions. On this journey, we have sought to share our findings and our advice along the way with others. And we have done that through the recording of a podcast, we've had articles, and we had a, a, um, an, an important information 
Foundation evening last November. And it was at that event in November that it really came across within the room that people wanted to understand more about what the options were for the future in relation to this article. And I'm delighted to say that Denise Roach, the Legal and Policy Officer of the National Women's Council of Ireland, is joining us this evening to outline for us one of those proposals, that of the National Women's Council of Ireland, in terms of having a look at the um, article and making it more gender neutral and encompassing the role of carers in society. But obviously Denise is best placed to tell you more about that. Just before we um, start with our first speaker, there's just a couple of um, housekeeping type points I'd just like to make. As I said, the Q&A session or the Q&A facility is available for everybody, so please feel free to use that. Um, the webinar itself is being recorded, and so you may wish to ensure that your video is switched off, just so you know it has been recorded. That's an option that's available for you. Um, I hope that everybody's microphones are off. Um, there is a CPD certificate available. I think it's on the chat function. I'll be corrected if I'm wrong on that. And you can, you're, please feel free to download that CPD certificate to self-certify um, your attendance at the webinar this evening. And finally, we are going to have a poll, which we're going to take hopefully um, near the at the end of the three speakers. So we would invite you to participate in that poll because we'd love to know what people's views are. And um, as I said, there's clearly huge interest in the topic, and uh, it would be really nice at the end of the session to have a, have an um, an understanding of where people are at in terms of the poll, and we'll share the results of the poll with you at the end. Um, so. That's all I have to say for now. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you every, everybody for joining us. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Anne Conlon Barrister um, to uh, present for us on the legal aspects of Article 41.2. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you, Cathy. Uh, just get my technology up and running. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted that there are so many people uh, on, online this evening. This is a new format for a lot of us to do something like this in. Um, just by way of background, I am a barrister. Um, I have a general practice. I specialise in employment law, and medical negligence law and personal injury. Um, I have a particular interest in gender and human rights, and it was a great pleasure um, to have the opportunity to do the research for the Irish Women's Lawyers Association um, in December 2018. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about this evening is really um, three things. I'm just going to talk a little bit about case law. I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, reports and recommendations that have been gathering pace um, over many years, and then hopefully ending up with you know what are the next steps. So um, just initially, I thought we just look a little bit at Article 41. Um, it will be very familiar to some, not to others. Um, and I'm just going to read the underlying section. That, so in particular, the state recognises that by her life within the home, woman gives to the state a support without which the common good cannot be achieved. The state shall therefore endeavour to ensure that mothers shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labour to the neglect of their duties in the home. Um, the critical word in this is endeavour. So reading this, a person at first glance might think, well, a woman should be able to stay in the home and if she needs economic support, the state will provide it. Um, at a pinch, she might even be inclined to think that she should be entitled to have a home. But the word endeavour is the problem because the word endeavour ineffective, effectively lets the state off the hook because it simply means the state will try. Um, and this particular article has been described by um, Mr Justice Barrington as a duty of imperfect obligation, which I think really sets it in, in context. So um, when he was presenting to the um, Con Convention on the Constitution in 2013, um, Professor Jerry White said that his presentation would be brief simply because this provision we are looking at, Article 41.2, is not one that has received much attention from the courts. And in fact, um, Dr. Liam Thornton of uh, UCD has done some analysis of in, in how often has this uh, Article 
41.2 appeared in the courts. Um, and it's transpired that approximately 25 cases it has been involved in, and of those, it was absolutely incidental in at least 15 of them. So there are a small handful of cases where it actually played some um, role, some, some more significant than others. And I'm just going to look at, at some of those cases. So there are four cases in which Article 41.2 has been used to justify uh, discrimination on the grounds of gender. Interestingly, it's been used in two cases to discriminate against men, and it's been used in two cases to discriminate against women. So we can say there's equality there. Um, in the first case, um, Dennehy, um, Mr. Dennehy was a deserted um, husband. Um, his wife had left and he had two children, age two and age four, and he gave up work. He tried to work, but wasn't able to maintain it, eventually gave up work and wasn't entitled to deserted husband payment, which was payable to women, deserted wives, in the period 1970 to 1990. Um, so he challenged the constitutionality of the Social Welfare Consolidation Act of 1981, saying that his rights um, were, that he was being treated in an unfair manner. And um, ultimately, he didn't prevail. The court held that um, both Article 40.1, which I'll come back to a little later on, and 41.2 justified the states um, giving advantage to women um, based on the grounds of law and policy. In Loud, it was a similar case, also a deserted husband, um, and again challenging the, the, on the same basis as Mr. Dennehy. Um, however, that case not alone went to the High Court, which Dennehy had gone, but also went to the Supreme Court and was rejected there also on, on similar grounds. In De Burke and Anderson, which is quite a, a famous case, um, De Burke and Anderson were being prosecuted for protesting outside the Dáil in relation to housing. Um, and they, they took a case challenging the constitutionality of the Juries Act of 1927 on the basis that the Juries Act of 1927 had exempted women from serving, in, uh, serving on juries, such that a woman had to apply to serve in a jury. And even then she had to get over an additional threshold, which was to be on a jury, you had to have a property with a certain rate of evaluation. And obviously women very often didn't have access to property and couldn't meet that requirement. So they said the Juries Act is, is unfair, is unconstitutional. Um, and they succeeded in their, in their case. They, 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 they won their argument. But interestingly, in a dissenting judgment, um, the Chief Justice at the time um, said the following of Article 41.2. When one considers uh, the special recognition of women and mothers in Article 41 of our Constitution, it does not appear inappropriate that the state and its laws should give some preference to women. In TOG versus the Attorney General, this was a, a rather sad case, um, the plaintiff had been um, had adopted a child with his um, wife and they had the child for six months before the final adoption order came through. And when the final before the final adoption order came through, um, his wife sadly passed away. And he was deemed ineligible to adopt um, because his wife, because he was a widower, whereas widows were allowed to continue with the adoption. So he challenged um, the relevant section, I think section five of the 1976 Adoption Act. Um, and he said, you know, my rights uh, are being, uh, I'm being unfairly treated, I'm being discriminated against. And counsel for the state in that particular case tried to argue that the different treatment between a widow and a widower um, was justified on the basis of Article 41.2.1. Um, uh, but, but the court wasn't having any of it and, um, and ruled in favour of the, the, the plaintiff. Uh, just two more. So in Sinnott, many will remember this case. Um, this was Cathy and Jamie Sinnott. Um, and she was the, Miss, Mrs. Sinnott was the second plaintiff in this action. Um, and she, she basically was arguing that the state had failed to respect and defend and vindicate her rights as a mother in its failure to provide education um, for appropriate education services for her son. And in that failing to do that had placed an inordinate burden on her um, and she succeeded in the high court but failed um, before a seven judge supreme court 
with only one dissenting judgment, and that was Mrs. Justice Denham, who was uh, subsequently Chief Justice Denham and was the only woman on the court at that time. Um, and an interesting aside in that particular case is that Mr. Justice Gagan um, said in his judgment that there's no doubt that in an appropriate case, the mother might be able to claim breaches of constitutional duties towards her under Articles 41.2.1 and 41.2.2, which are the two I read when we started. Um, but in an interesting commentary, um, Dr. Laura Cahalan from the University of Limerick, who's done um, terrific work in this area, has commented that unfortunately we're in, we are not given any clue as to what an appropriate case might be. Um, the final case then is probably the most famous case on Article 41.2. So in BL versus Emma, which is frequently known as L versus L, this was a case where the couple were separating and the wife sought to claim a beneficial interest in the family home on the basis, uh, despite the fact that she hadn't made a contribution in money or money's worth, but she had looked after the home, looked after the children, and she'd given occasional assistance to her husband in his work. Um, and in the High Court, uh, Mr. Justice Barr found that she did have a right to a beneficial interest, but even then only in the family home and in no other property of her husband's. Um, he, the husband, appealed that the decision of the High Court to the Supreme Court, um, and the Supreme Court um, found un unanimously overturned the decision of the High Court therefore finding in favour of the husband. Um, and the Chief Justice uh, noted that to have given a right to the wife in the particular case would have required the identity of, to it would require the court to identify a brand new right. Um, now, there's a few other things to be said about this case. Um, Jerry White in his presentation to the Convention on the Constitution said that um, that this case was a somewhat ambitious attempt to use Article 41 to, in order to create an entitlement in part on the part of wives to have a share in the value of the matrimonial home. Um, interestingly, the counsel for the wife in this case was Mrs. Justice Catherine McGuinness. Um, Dr. Cahalan subsequently, in, in, in much more recent years, a couple of years ago, interviewed um, Mrs. Justice Catherine McGuinness um, about this particular case. and. Um, the commentary goes on that at the time there'd been some talk about the potential use of the provision and whether they could use some use could be made of it um, in terms of could you use article 41.2 thus um, she and her junior counsel uh, when they encountered a brave client um, they decided to have a go but um, as Dr. Cahalan has noted article 41.2 is now effectively meaningless and no further litigation will be taken directly on its provisions and by that for the non-lawyers and I should have said this um, earlier for the lawyers um, I hope I'm legal enough and for the non-lawyers I hope I'm not too legal but the, the point being that after the decision in L versus L no lawyer could advise their client to take an action based on it because it won't stand up in, in, a, in a court of law. So I found myself thinking when I was doing this presentation, well, that's all fine and well in the home and what's going on for women outside the home then? Um, and you have these depressing figures is all I can say about them. So in the Dáil, women are 22.5% of TDs. Um, the CSO did a survey last year on large enterprises and in large enterprises, the chairpersons of boards, female were 7.4%, CEOs were 19.6%. Gender pay gap between 2013 and 2017 rose from 12.9 to 14.4. And I note that last month, Bank of Ireland released their gender pay gap figure and said it's 24.4%. And they explained that by saying that the majority of their senior staff were women. Oh, we're sorry, apologies, were men. Um, so just to, that, that sort of sets everything in context, home and workplace and where government is made. So moving on then to the reports and recommendations. Well, Article 41.2 has been discussed for a long time. So the first discussion was in 1993 with the Second Commission on the Status of Women. Um, and there have been 10, between that and up to current day, there have been 10 reports. 
two by the UN and eight other reports. And in virtually all, in, in all reports, there's been suggestions of change. Um, just to pick some, the Convention on the Constitution of 2013 made recommendations to amend the article, make it gender neutral, to include carers, um, and that the state should provide a reasonable level of support. Um, the task force of the Department of Justice and Equality in 2016 made reports, made, made, made refer, further re recommendations about replacing home or family life and providing support for carers in the home. But in 2016, the government, in their programme for a partnership government, made a commitment to hold a referendum. Um, and if you can remember, there was a proposal that Article 41.2 would be dealt with at the same time as the blasphemy referendum, but they couldn't get agreement on it. And so what the government did was they sent it off to an Iraq, this, uh, they sent the bill off to the Iraq, this Joint Committee on Justice and Equality. Um, that committee had 11 members, uh, three women. Um, it held public meetings and it sought submissions and nine groups or individuals um, made submissions to it and they were, the, the committee itself pretty well broke the ultimate, sort of the, broke down the positions that were made into three different positions. So delete simpliciter and, and what that means is delete unconditionally. Um, and the minister and Dr. Cahalan, um, was just McGuinness and the SRI were in favour of, of delete simpliciter. The minister said that his legal advice was that that would be the best option. Um, one of the predominant arguments in this regard was that there would be no unintended consequences. And what's meant by that is if you take it out, but you replace it with something else, then the something else may ultimately be interpreted in the courts such that something occurs that you never intended to occur in the first place. In, with regard to um, the second uh, group of proposals that were put forward, fundamentally they, they, they could be summed up as to amend the article with either a symbolic recognition or with a, con or with a recognition which would include socioeconomic rights. So either put in something that doesn't actually have rights but shows our intent um, to uh, recognize the importance of carers or socioeconomic put money on the table with, with these rights. Um, and it would, be to, would have been to change the, the article so that the language would be gender neutral and possibly in some inclusion of family and carers to be determined. Um, and the Human Rights, um, the Irish Human Rights um, Commission, um, the Women's Council, Denise will put forward their, their view shortly um, and a number of others. And then the third group surrounded um, amend which actually really meant repeal in, in reading the report uh, to, am to, to amend the, the article, stroke repeal it, and add a new provision to Article 45, recarers. Now, I'm just going to explain this a little bit when it says non-justiciable. Every other, every other article of the Constitution, one should be able to go into court, um, as I jokingly call it, take your bun rock in the hair and, and bang it down in front of the judge and say, judge, I see to rely on my rights as set out in this particular article. Article 45 is different. And what it says, I'm just going to read it down the bottom there. It says, the principles of social policy set out in this article are intended for the general guidance of the Oireachtas. The application of those principles and the making of laws shall be the care of the Oireachtas exclusively and shall not be cognizable by any court under any of the provisions of this constitution. So whatever is in under 45, you cannot rely on in court. It's, an, I, I think it's maybe best set out as aspirational and guidance towards the Oireachtas in, in terms of future policy. So the outcome of the, the Oireachtas Committee's uh, report was given in December of 2018. And basically they sort of said, the general consensus is that 41.2 was outdated, sexist, in need of change. That was general consensus by all those who submitted. Um, and then they arrived at two options. The first option was to replace Article 41.2 with an alternative provision, something maybe including home, family, life, carers, no allocation of public funds, so no socioeconomic rights. An option the, B then was for that a more public engagement should be should take place with a broader discussion on the role of um, care work and whether or not symbolic or socioeconomic rights should be included. The Citizens Assembly has the topic of Article 41.2 in it, on its agenda and they commenced their meetings in February but obviously with all that's happened those have been um, postponed for the moment. Um, so where, are, where do we go from here? Well, as a lawyer, 
the Irish Women's Lawyers Association was really keen to get to grips with it, what exactly this was all about and determine what position we, we would take on it. And as a lawyer, the question you always ask about a law is, does it work? And clearly, Article 41.2, as, as it stands, does not work. And so we would say it should be repealed. Simply take it out. And we'd say, though, that there were two debates rather than one. So on the one hand, there is a debate about do you take it out or do you leave it in? And then we think it's a better if there's a second debate held about is there something else you want to put into the Constitution and where do you want to put it and what rights do you want to give? But we think as it stands to keep it simple, take it out and then move on to a discussion that reflects our, you know, evolving and developing society and about what we want into the future. So I hope that's been of some help in setting out the evening. I'm very much looking forward to the other speakers myself and thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. That was so interesting. And it was a really um, thorough analysis of how this article has been dealt with um, since, since its enactment in Bunrock na um, just Your last point just reminds me of something I did mean, mean to say at the start, and that is that the Irish Women Lawyers Association did make a submission to the Citizens' Assembly on gender. And we have um, submitted it within that submission that it is our view that it should be repealed um, simpliciter. But I, so I just wanted to point that out for people. So now I'm delighted to move on to our next speaker, who is Rosemary Hayden's solicitor, and as I said, also on the committee of the Irish Women Lawyers Association. And Rosemary's going to talk to us about the historical context, and she's also going to have a look at the article uh, in the current times that we are in. So thank you very much, Rosemary. Hi everyone and thanks very much for the intro there Cathy. Um, I'm here to provide a little bit of context and uh, the idea with the context is that we'll be, we'll be looking at how did we get here? How did we get into the 1937 constitution? And um, just to, to show myself up as the uh, historian side, I'm struggling with my slides again for the, the backwards and forwards. So um, if you just bear with me just one moment. And there it is, fantastic, we're in business now. Okay, so in our initial uh, seminar, uh, which we had back in November, which seems like literally another world, uh, we looked at the historical context of 1930s Ireland and how that uh, had us end up with the 1937 constitution. And particularly, obviously, um, today that we're interested in Article 41.2, and we referred to it, the international developments of the time. But now today, what we're looking at um, is the, context of the 1937 but also the context of today and the COVID-19 scenario and what does that what does that mean as it reshapes what it means to be at work what it means to be at home to work from home and the vital context to, to review the integration of home and work and family and home work family and uh, women and the law and family and whatnot it's a particular interest of mine um, from uh, from my bachelor's days and uh, marriage settlements in, in the 19th century Ireland was a, a topic that uh, doesn't get enough lot of attention but uh, got a lot of my attention at the time. So giving a little bit of the background, how did we actually get towards the, the Bunrick and the Heron time? Well we, we came through the Free State time and um, there was essentially we had the, the Easter Rising and the election of Countess Markowitz as the first woman elected to Parliament in both Ireland and England had given the women's movement certain reason to believe that women's rights would continue to develop and the end of World War One and the return of millions of men from war seeking you know seeking their work and you know seeking to return to work led to somewhat of a rolling back of progress. So when the war, or as it was in Ireland, the emergency anyway, uh, was in place, huge social change took place over those four years from 1914 to 1918. Women were utilised as a necessary replacement um, to the over 200,000 absent combatants uh, from Ireland. And uh, the pictures from this uh, factory here, you can see in the background, that's uh, from Dublin in 1915. Um, so women had, had been brought into the workplace as a, a kind of a necessary stopgap, not because you know, uh, society necessarily wanted them there, but because they ran out of other people, other men to, to be in, in there. So there had been a huge change take place all over the world um, in those four years. So by the time you came to the end of World War I, there was no real, there was no real going back to the pre-war world. So the 1912 uh, Home Rule Act, which had been due to take, uh, take effect at the end of the war, was never going to, to cut it, um, certainly not after the Easter Rising. 
1916. So at the end of, of uh, World War I, our, our society was ripe for a new world of self-determination and equality. And what did that look like? Well, in 1919, we had the first doll, and the first doll made the Declaration of Independence. Now, the Declaration, um, we often, um, you know, uh, are, are quite familiar with the proclamation in 1916 from the, the, um, uh, from the GPO, but, but this is the Declaration of Independence from the first stall in 1919 in the Mansion House. And it gave the national policy that the national policy would be based upon the people's will with equal right and equal opportunity for every citizen. So that's very egalitarian. The language is very is gender, gender neutral. Um, and there was a very prevailing sense at the time that many groups which had felt that their rights weren't vindicated within the British Empire would be more more fully vindicated within an Irish Republic where all were equal before the law. And very interesting the context there um, of um, what Anne was speaking about um, and a woman's right um, to, to serve in a jury, for example. You know, there's no equality there when a woman has to prove by by, by owning property, um, a, a bar that the man doesn't have to, to, to get over. Um, the Free State Constitution, which we then brought in, was very much noted for its secular tone and its egalitarian ethos. It, it echoed the French Republican call for equality, liberty, fraternity, and um, it had been a feature of the Easter Rising in particular that there were a number of disparate groups um, who all were looking for, you know, the fight for independence from British rule tied into all of the vindication of their rights. So we're looking at rights of workers, white rights of security of tenure for tenants, as well as women's rights. So there's a real sense that we're going to have a republic of equals. We're building a society for, for everyone, for all of the citizens. So how did we move from there? Well, the egalitarian ethos underwent significant uh, adjustment by the 1930s. And what's happening there? Well, we have the Great Depression of the 1930s. There's a very financial um, uh, downturn and um, the sort of egalitarian and, uh, uh, you know, rights-based ethos of uh, the free state um, constitution, which had had a uh, Bill of Rights, it had had, um, you know, very progressive elements, it, it allowed for divorce, um, you know, there was an awful lot of progression in there and there's a rolling back then in the 30s when we come to the time of the Great Depression you've got mass unemployment you've got a lot of men out of work and there's again there's a return to family values veneration of the family based on marriage and the picture there you see is actually a recipient of what's called the uh, cross of honor of the German mother and the cross of honor of the German mother was awarded in the 30s and um, to women based on the number of children so it was awarded in classes of bronze silver and gold acknowledging women's status based based on marriage, obviously, but also on how many children they could actually provide to uh, the German state. So when you're looking at that, that sort of context then, women in, in employment is certainly something that, that's tolerated at best rather than uh, encouraged. This veneration of the family based on marriage very much a feature of um, the constitution um, of 1937, but that's, that's, there's nothing terribly unusual in Ireland of that time um, internationally. There's similar provisions featuring the constitutions in Poland, Estonia, uh, Serbia, uh, Spain, Portugal, Germany. There, you know, it was a prevailing um, aspect of the time. So another point to note is that the family based on marriage is the only type of family that is, um, is in any way acknowledged. Um, there's no, there is no family except the family based on, based on marriage. So a little bit of the background of how we ended up with the, the ethos that you see and the change in ethos from the free state constitution, secular egalitarian ethos, to Bunrick Meharan and the far more Catholic and, um, you know, was a family values, traditional uh, constitutional kind of uh, background. So you'll see there are two, um, uh, two key uh, people when it comes to Bunrick Meharan. You've got, um, Archbishop, um, well, as he was then, Father John McQuaid, but later Archbishop John Charles McQuaid, um, with De Valera. Um, and McQuaid was heavily involved in um, setting out the status of women within the formation of Articles 40 to 45, dealing with personal rights, the family, education, private property, 
uh, religion, directed policies of social policy. Um, and it's, it's, it's famously noticed that um, De Vlaer would send drafts of the, uh, the constitution to McQuaid to, to have a look over. And interestingly, if you have a look at the quote there from McQuaid, there's a direct uh, quote from McQuaid, not that women would be prevented from engaging in this or that career, but that a certain class of women, namely mothers, will not be forced by pressure or need to engage in work so as to neglect their proper home duties. Now, I mean, that, that's almost an exact mirroring of the, the uh, article as it ended up. And this very much tallied with de Valera's contribution in the Dahl debate on the provision, that, the, that this provision was meant to protect mothers. And um, uh, very interesting in, in the context of de, de Valera's own background, that he himself, his mother, was obliged very much by financial necessity to work not only outside the home, but actually to leave the home and work in the US. She was working in New York. He was left with his grandmother in Ireland. So that's, you know, that, that provides a sort of a, a context that tells us that it's not necessarily about um, keeping women in their place, that de Valera saw this as a, as a protection that was being given to women. Um, so it could well have been influenced by, by that experience. So a little bit there, just a few highlights on the article as we ended up with the guarantee um, you know, um, to uh, protect and that we were indispensable, that the necessary basis of social order and that the family was indispensable to the welfare of the nation and that by her life within the home, woman gives to the state a support without which the common good cannot be achieved. And then, as you'll see, we change from woman directly over to mother. Um, so that's an interesting one, that woman and mother are entirely interchangeable. And of course, I've, ah, there we go. No, apologies now, the slides are uh, moving uh, the pictures around the, around the page to be able to move on my slides. So I'm just going to, yeah, put that in there. Apologies. Um, there we go. Okay. So sorry, I'll bring you back there now. Okay. So the reaction to um, Bunrank and the Heron um, was mixed, we'll say, uh, certainly relating to um, these particular articles. Um, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington said of the new constitution that it was based on, and she didn't pull any punches here, uh, based on a fascist model in which women would be relegated to permanent inferiority. She saw a man's world that we women live in run by man for man, and she warned of the evidence of a setback to women, especially in countries such as Germany and Italy, where fascist power is strong. So, I mean, that's really interesting in the context of, uh, you know, as I was showing you there, the um, the cross of the German mother and so on. So she's she's very much aware of the social context um, that we're looking at. And around the same time, we had the 1935 Employment Bill, um, which she, uh, Skeffington was was absolutely eviscerating as well, saying that it out Hitler's Hitler, and um, due to Section 12, which gave the minister for industry, the party limit the number of women in industry on an industry by industry basis, or even to remove them altogether from, uh, from employment. Um, now, this um, reaction obviously um, uh, had, uh, we'll say, an equal and opposite reaction. And um, that reaction um, came from, for example, ministers um, or, and former ministers. And uh, you can see here a lovely, um, uh, what would you say, um, primary source document here from, um, it's actually on this day, 1937, um, J.J. Walsh, um, who was the former Minister for Post and Telegraphs at the time, writing to W.T. Cosgrave. And um, I think it actually bears um, just a little kind of look at it. Um, because it's a really interesting document just for the social context. Um, I don't know how you stand in regard to the suffragette agitation arising out of the Constitution, but I feel that it is time the wheel was reversed. From the standpoint of this country and its trials and troubles since the Anglo-Irish War, it was a tragedy that women were enabled to play any part whatever. Their poisoned fangs were everywhere in evidence, as you're well aware, and the leaders of those days are still leading. In the light of experience, I consider it wholly wrong to encourage women to emulate men in different spheres, and the very women are found to differ from this view, and very few women, pardon me, are found to differ from this viewpoint. In any case, there's nothing to gain but much to lose by encouraging the Sheehy Skeffingtons and notoriety seekers of that ilk to get in the centre of the fair so that they might intrude their narrow views on the community. This little gang is now looking to your party to place them on the map. I hope your memory is as long as mine. Don't trouble to reply. And that really is uh, unanswerable, really. And um, so that's uh, essentially the picture of where we were um, the context of 1937. And where are we now with the benefit of a little bit of 
vision um, of our, our 2020, um, not as we would have expected it, but um, the 2020 that we have. So from the vantage point of our, our work from home lives with Wi-Fi and Zoom and the benefit of, of legal protections that were not available at the time uh, of the, the Constitution, um, it might seem that we have little in common with the society of the 1930s, but this recent experience of COVID-19 has thrown up some very interesting aspects um, showing the relative experience of men and women uh, in gender terms in uh, relation to work and home during the pandemic. So a little bit more on that. Um, if we have a look at the research and the research on research, we'll say, um, the, um, uh, there's a paper um, uh, in Nature published last month and also this um, basically consolidation research by CERP um, indicating that and what you're looking at there is the relative um, participation of men and women in uh, publishing research. And what you're seeing there on the blue lines is um, the pre-pandemic times and then the red lines are the current pandemic times and what you're seeing in the lower number is the percentage of these publications that are actually published by women. Now you can see that the non-COVID um, publications have stayed fairly stable for women but for men they have increased men in some cases have increased their uh, publications by up to 50 percent but that's on an industry by industry basis the COVID publications is a little bit more stark though so the percentage of female authors which would normally be around the 20 percent drops here to about 12 percent so women are essentially able to continue with um, the existing research but they're not able to start new research and the consideration then is how did that actually, you know, what's, what's actually causing that? Why are women disproportionately not uh, being as productive as, um, as men are during this time? So a little bit here from um, uh, commentator Professor James Wilsden, Research on Research, a uh, lovely name uh, there, the Wellcome Trust uh, in the UK. We have to be very cautious that we're not privileging those who are able to use the coronavirus situation, excuse me, um, as the time to reach ahead of their peers who are held back not by talent or aspiration but by the need to do homeschooling and put three meals a day on the table. So the data suggests that home duties are impacting on women's productivity. So when we look back on Article 41.2, the concept is that it's there to ensure that mothers shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labour to the neglect of their duties in the home. It would very much appear that the pandemic has had the impact of ensuring that mothers' duties in the home have asserted their, their primacy to the detriment of their paid work. There is German research indicating that women are overseeing the majority of homeschooling while in the US and the unemployment statistics uh, indicate that women are disproportionately affected by a loss of employment and this coupled with the de delayed return of school and childcare together with the statistic that women tend to work in lower paid industries could lead to an increase of women returning to their duties in the home not by choice but by the removal of other options. So the working from home divide, gender divide, um, shows us that for every, and this is BBC research, um, obviously the UK, um, and basically it's showing us that for every three hours of paid work, um, a father, um, and this is research on, on parents, um, a father can do, the mother um, does one hour of paid work. So in Ireland, the gendered nature of the experience of the pandemic um, has also uh, received commentary from um, our colleagues in NCWI, uh, among others. And the gendered nature of the experience of the pandemic, it does continue. The less favourable treatment, for example, of women returning from maternity leave in relation to social welfare payments demonstrates that this is a practical, not just a, a theoretical issue. So where do we go from here? Well, just to finish up, I'm just going to, to um, uh, bring you a quote from um, a publication uh, called Rogue, um, which really resonated with me. COVID-19 might not be the great leveller, but it could yet be the great change bringer. It's causing us to look at how we do everything. Yes, we want to get back to normal, but more than anything, but maybe there is also the chance to give certain things the domestic gender gap amongst them and make over and establish a new normal. And at that point, I'm just going to say thank you all very much for listening. And I'll hand back to uh, Cathy to, uh, to take you through to our, our final speaker. Rosemary, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, the ability to go from 
the foundations of our state right up to um, the current days we're living in through the prism of Article 41.2. It was fascinating. So, so thank you so much. I really enjoyed listening to that and I'm sure everybody else did too. Um, so we have great pleasure in um, welcoming uh, Denise Roach from the National Women's Council of Ireland this evening. Um, you've heard us mention the position that may have been taken by NWCI on this particular journey, but no, no one better to tell us about that, <laughs> tell us about it in detail, is Denise. So Denise, um, you're very welcome and we look forward to um, hearing your speech. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Cathy. And everyone can hear me? Great. <laughs> it's always good to check. So. A cursory read of Article 41.2 would lead most to conclude that it has no place in our Constitution. And I'm sure there are many who will be shocked to learn that such an article even exists within the pages of our Constitution. In a recent publication on gender in the Irish Constitution, Alan Brady, a lecturer with Trin Trinity College, writes that rereading the text of Article 41.2 continues to be a powerful experience. The language is arresting, the use of the generic woman without any definite or indefinite article, her place with its overtones of subservience. And he goes on to call it a quite stunning example of linguistic gender stereotyping and an appeal to a false universal notion of womanhood. Such language, which could as best be described as unfortunate at the time of its drafting in 1937, is in 2020 completely at odds with the lived experience of a huge number of Irish women. However, in 2018, when the government proposed a referendum to remove the article, the National Women's Council opposed it. And we did so not to retain the article, but to reclaim it. Our position is that we amend Article 41.2 to provide an opportunity to recognize care in a more gender neutral and inclusive way. And this is a position we adopted drawing from the collective voice of our members. However, we do understand the impulse and the drive towards deletion. The language in the article is sexist and discriminatory. It does not encompass the variety and diversity of experiences which women have. It does not recognize the work which men currently do as carers, nor does it recognize that men have duties and responsibilities to be carers. It does not recognize the range of different types of care. It includes a definition of family that does not reflect the reality of families in Ireland, nor the diversity of family life. It presumes a male breadwinner model, a two parent household where a woman stays at home, and does not take into account the reality of lone parents, LGBTQI families or blended families. Its placement in the Constitution could have led to the recognition of the value of the contribution women make through unpaid care work in society. However, it has faced minimal judicial scrutiny. It has had little or no impact on the positive formulation of social policy or improving the position of women. In fact, it provided the constitutional and cultural background for the marriage bar and its detrimental impact on women's choices, employment and economic independence, the legacy of which we are still dealing with today. In practice, Article 41.2 has not supported the home or family. It has merely diminished women. But what it does do, albeit in so doing it, it as ascribes the role exclusively to women is expressly recognises the role of caregiving in Irish society. And so why may you ask, is it important that we continue to recognise care in our constitution? Well, two things must be understood about care. First, care is essential to the common good and performs vital social and economic functions. And secondly, the issue of care is central to women's equality. Every member of our society is dependent on the care of others at some stage in their life. Every adult was once a child and many will require care during their adult life too, particularly in the later stages of it. In Irish society, most of this care work is done on an informal and an unpaid basis. And care work is not easily commodified or, modified or monetized, but it is clear that without the substantial amount of unpaid care work done in Irish society, the country would be unable to function socially or economically. And care is not a luxury of private family life. It is essential to the continued survival of our society 
and presents a strong moral imperative for the state to recognise and support care. Notwithstanding this, informal unpaid care work is rather invisible, subsumed into what has traditionally been termed as women's work. But this is a, tra tra but this is a tradition that has a lot and that in a lot of ways has carried on. In the four decades since the 1980s, there has been a significant increase in women's participation in the labour market. But this has not been balanced by an equal increase in the contribution of men to domestic care work. Women continue to provide the lion's share of unpaid informal care work in Irish society. And recent data from the Central Statistics Office showed that in 2019, 94% of those whose principal economic status is looking after home and family were women. When hours spent on paid employment are accounted for, women still carry out more hours of care than men. Research from the Institute for Fiscal Studies and University College London suggests that COVID-19 has not altered the care burden. In homes, and I think uh, Rosemary had been talking about this study earlier, um, in homes where there's a working mother and father, women are doing more chores and spending more time with children. They found that mums were only able to do one hour of uninterrupted work for every three hours done by dads. The findings applied to families where a mother and father were both working, as well as to families where both parents were forelonged or out of work. The only set of households where the study saw mothers and fathers sharing childcare and housework equally were those in which both parents were previously working, but the father had since stopped working for pay, while the mother was still being paid. However, mothers in these circumstances were doing on average five hours of paid work in addition to the same amount of domestic work as their partner. The continuing reliance on women to carry out the majority of care and unpaid care work has consequences for women's economic equality and creates significant vulnerabilities for women through the power and financial imbalances it creates. The choices women can make with regard to employment are further severely limited due to a lack of public infrastructure of early years care. Women are more likely to be stuck in low paid and low skilled employment, and this is particularly true for low parent, lone parents. Women will frequently name their caring responsibilities and lack of financial resources, including houses, as barriers to exiting unsafe and violent relationships. So we need to acknowledge care in a real and substantive way. And we believe that the first step towards doing this will be to recognize it in our constitution. We accept, given the history of the article and its limited utility in advancing rights to date, such a statement, however reformulated, is unlikely to offer substantive legal protection for the women and men who provide care in our society. But it can provide a strong symbolic commitment, and symbolism is important. Indeed, one of the functions of a constitution is to carry symbolic statements about the nation. As Flynn concluded in discussing construct of masculinity within our constitution, law is one of the state sites at which the self is formed and shaped, along with education, religion, medicine, and the other constituents of culture. In this sense, law operates as a social contract in which identities are assumed, altered, and traded. This process is particularly powerful in the realm of constitutional law because in defining the boundaries of public power, the nature of the state and the role of the citizen, a constitution claims to be the base from which public power is constituted and implicitly on which key aspects of legal personhood are constructed. Right now, Article 41.2 is a symbol of a bygone era, a statement of the values of the time that infused the nation's self, sense of itself with outdated gendered roles. So what could be more symbolic than taking this sexist article and reformulating it to reflect the world we live in today? This would be particularly symbolic for women. Taking an article that was crafted exclusively by men about women without our input and reshaping it to reflect all of our lives. Let's not forget that the drafters of the 1937 constitution were all men. 
uh, de Valera was supported by an all-male civil service committee and then sought external advice from influential experts of the day, such as the Chief Justice and the President of the High Court and the Archbishop of Dublin, all of course men. I might add that if we choose to simply delete the article, that the symbolic that there ha that has symbolic effect too, but perhaps not the one we one we care to embrace. I also believe that it is a mistake to give something up or give it away, expecting that you will be afforded another opportunity to revisit the matter. This is our moment to discuss care in the context of the Constitution. Deleting the provision would not guarantee a later discussion. Care work is an essential function in Irish society. And Article 41.2 made some effort to recognise this, but it did so clumsily and without any recognition and uh, of the responsibility of men to engage with such work. And a reformed article can go some way towards building an equal and visible model of care work in Ireland. And NWCI are not alone in reaching this conclusion. Um, our, the uh, article 41.2 has been the subject of numerous recommendations and considerations by key bodies over the years. There has been near consensus amongst those various bodies and reports that the article should be amended rather than repealed so that it could play a symbolic role in valuing care work. In addition to official reports and commentary, multiple bodies and stakeholders have called for changes to Article 41.2. So the Committee on the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and the UN Human Rights Council have both called for a modification of the language. In 2018, the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission re reiterated its position that the article should be amended to make it gender neutral. While the article certainly is currently being examined by the Citizens' Assembly, it should be recalled that this is, that it was all already examined by a group of citizens during the Convention on the Constitution in about 2012. This was the precursor to the Citizens' Assembly, so it was slightly different in formulation, with 66 randomly selected citizens mixed with 33 parliamentarians and an independent chairperson. When the members of the Constitutional Convention voted to express their views, the majority of them favoured a change to the Constitution to amend the clause, and if making such a change, a majority recommended that it should be gender neutral and to include other carers in the home, and that it should also include carers beyond the home. The convention also recommended that the state should offer a reasonable level of support to ensure that carers shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labor outside the home. In fact, 88% of people said that the article should not be left as, as it is, with 88% choosing to amend or modify. Pardon me, only 12% favoured a straightforward deletion. So what do we mean by care? Care or unpaid work in the home encompasses broad ranges of duties such as housework and preparing meals, the unpaid work that many women in rural areas do on the family farm and small businesses and care for children and older family members, friends or neighbours and, and support and care for those with disabilities. Women with disabilities are not passive recipients of care, but individuals whose rights are intertwined with those, predominantly women, that provide that care. Therefore, we propose an inclusive statement about the importance of care and care work by both women and men in Irish society. And we believe that the new text should include the following principles. It should assert that caring for each other and care work is essential for the good of everyone in our society. It should be gender neutral to recognise the care work done by both men and women and recognise care work done inside the home, in families, as well as within the broader community. And as a consequence, we have formulated the following statement for consideration by the Citizens' Assembly that the state recognises that care provided by the home, family and community gives society a support without which the common good cannot be achieved. Recognising care in this way acknowledges the valuable work done by thousands of women and men every day in this country. It invites men to take on more responsibility. It extends the definition of care to include care outside the home and in the community. It confirms that the state will seek to support carers. 
The proposal is just one part of a sweep of changes that we need to make to the Constitution to truly achieve equality in our society. Uh, pardon me. We have other recommendations concerning socioeconomic rights, the definition of family to name it to name but a few, as well as a number of legislative proposals. And we've made these to ensure that we adequately address the economic inequality experience as a consequence of care, caring responsibilities and caring needs. I might add that this article has been examined a number of times and putting aside what NWCI and indeed her members believe, the overwhelming conclusion has been to amend and retain rather than to delete this article. But when the government proposed a referendum on it, it was with the sole intent to delete. The argument that was presented was that the language was sexist and demeaning to women and had no place in our constitution. And indeed, they would have no argument from us on that front. It is indeed sexist, um, demeaning and deeply troubling. But deleting the language could have been achieved while still recognizing care in a gender neutral fashion. And this, this leads me to wonder if perhaps there is some small concern that if the article is amended and retained, given its location within the Constitution, that it may give rise to actionable rights. And if you are not swayed by the necessity for symbolism, is this possibility, however small, worth amending and retaining the article? I'll finish by saying that undoubtedly COVID the COVID-19 pandemic has brought the state's problematic relationship with care to the fore of most minds. Because this pandemic underscores society's reliance on women both on the front line and at the home line, while simultaneously exposing structural inequalities across every sphere, from health to the economy, security to social protection. And we believe that a robust recovery will happen by acknowledging, supporting and sharing women's collective burden of labour and care. We believe that recognising that all women work and that both paid and unpaid care and domestic labour is indispensable to human, economic and social progress and it is essential to achieving a more just society. Thank you. Denise, thank you so much for that. Um, what an impassioned um, presentation of the position that you have set out for us so articulately. Um, we really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I know that people will be very interested now in considering all of the different issues that you have raised. Um, so that brings us to the end of our formal um, presentations from our three fantastic speakers. Um, and I suppose at this stage, I'd like to um, go to um, the participants this evening and to get an understanding of the issues that are concerning them. So I'm going to go to Fiona McNulty, solicitor and committee member of the Irish Women Lawyers Association. And she's been keeping an eye on comments and questions and both on Zoom and uh, that have come to us through other media. So Fiona, I wonder, could you perhaps uh, get the ball rolling and let us know um, what is the first question we'd like to put to the panel um, this evening? Yes, it's great to see there's been brilliant interaction this evening um, through email and, and on the comments. There's one comment from Mary Louise Lynch and she's just noting that De Valera would not allow women to fight during the rising. Come and come on members who fought elsewhere in Dublin under different command, they could fight. De Valera always had a strong opinion on a woman's place. And I think that probably goes to Grace's contribution that the article is very much a, an article of its time. Um, moving on to questions, we have a really interesting question from Sinead Gibney. And Sinead has pointed out that while there's been plenty of discussion on Article 41.2, there has been little on 41.3.1, which states that the state pledges itself to guard with special care the institution of marriage on which the family is founded and to protect it against attack. This too is a gendered clause given that 85% of one parent families are headed by women. We know that single mothers have been demonized throughout Irish history. And as Rosemary points out, no families other than married families are acknowledged in the constitution. And what Sinead is wondering is, do the panel have any thoughts about whether this clause should also be reviewed? Well, um, I'm, I'm happy to start off there. Oh, Denise, I'll, you know. No, uh, just cover it. No, just to say that, no, we definitely agree with that. Um, it, it's not the, the definition of family within the constitution doesn't actually represent the families that we um, recognise and know today. And we have made a recommendation to the Citizens Assembly that that should be considered as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm I'm coming in there. I have a this is a personal bugbear of mine. I I I really you know there's so 
about the, the, the status of marriage and the idea that, um, you know, a family based on marriage is the fundamental building block of our society is saying that children who are born outside of marriage are then not part of that fundamental building block of society. So you're talking about the one third of children who are today born outside of, uh, of marriage and are then, you know, somehow not as, as important or not protected by the constitution. And I, I find that really um, just just not nice <laughs> you know uh, it's it's not nice to think that any child would be considered you know lesser than another um, on the basis of whether their parents are married or not I, I mean the status of children act 19 i think it was 87 and um, it was only at that point that we took out the, the notion of illegitimacy but what's really really interesting to me is that if you marry after your um say you have a child outside of marriage and you then marry um uh, the, the mother and father or what have you marry um after the child was born it's still the um the law of the land that you must then go and re-register the child's birth and uh, so, I mean, it, this is still a relevant issue. You, you're still saying, the state is still saying, not just in the constitution, but in, in, in legislation and in practice, that, you know, there's a certain status and value given to, uh, to marriage and to children within marriage that is not afforded to children outside of marriage. And I'd be more than happy to um, a march for the repeal of that. I think the only thought that um, comes to me on that is I completely agree. And mm -hmm. um, I think the reason we looked at 412, in particular from the Irish Women's Lawyers' point of view, was that it was the issue that the, um, was in the programme for government. Um, but to be honest, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think just these, um, I think there's other um, parts of the constitution that would require, that would benefit from a good overhaul. I, the preamble comes to mind immediately. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of work to be done in the Constitution to make it a, a document that is reflective of lived lives today. Uh, thank you very much, um, everybody. I, I suppose could I, I could see everybody nodding. Is the, everyone on the panel was agreeing with the point that was being made, um, but different different points made by each in response. So thank you for that. Um, I should have um, said prior to. Um, asking Fiona for the questions, I should have said that we, we were going to our poll and, and I was reminded kindly by Maeve Tlargi in relation to that. So we have a quick poll up there now, um, having heard everyone's presentations. So you might consider participating in that and we'll have a look at um, uh, the results later on. So perhaps Fiona, do you have another question there for the panel? Would you mind um, uh, giving them another one, please? Yes, uh, just while everyone's looking at that poll, uh, Paula Flanagan is wondering, does any other nation have care defined within a constitution or a social contract? Are there any other examples of this? Yeah, I think this came up actually in our last um, session and um, there were um, no real examples in the kind of the Northern Hemisphere, but um, I understand that there is a provision for a social contract in the South African uh, constitution. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but no, not an awful lot of them. Um, it's, not a, it's not a very common provision it seems. And we have another question possibly from a devil's advocate wondering if the article is harmless why could we not just leave it there? Don't know if anyone has a strong view on that. I'd say Anne might have a strong yeah. view. <laughs> Anne has a strong like view. I think we all have a strong view. Yeah. I, I, I do add that when I started, before I started the research, I'm normally a very opinionated person, and before I started the research on, on this, I, had, I actually had no strong opinion on it. When I was done with the research, I had a very strong opinion on it. Um, I, I think Denise made a really good point, which is that um, this article has stood there from 1937. Um, to date, and in that time, it has stood there as I would say a, a you know a support against a multitude of discriminatory legislation against women. Um, yes, the marriage bar, and then numerous other pieces of legislation. The Conditions of Employment Act come to mind. Um, I suppose you could say the Juries Act and various other things predated, but they were just um, demonstrative of a government that would, you know, of, of the thinking of the time. But there's a, you know, there's a lot that it's that's that's gone on that it's just stood there as a useless article, sort of. But but maybe you know, sort of setting a a perception about where women's place was. And so, I I think it does matter. I think if we talk about symbolism, um, it doesn't come much stronger than this, to, you know. So I I would say it needs it needs to come out. I mean, just from a a simple discriminatory 
equal treatment of people point of view. You know, your constitution is an important document. It does set out that, you know, the social contract between the state and the people, the aspirations of the people. Um, this is just not reflective of, I, it's the phrase I use, but people's lived lives, um, you know, and it's not that you need to keep changing a constitution, but there are simple tenets that are, that are, that are fundamental. And this is one of them. This is one which says, you don't single out a group of people and say, you know, that's the box you stay in. Um, and then you don't do that. And then, you, and, you know, and if you do that, at the very least, you give them an option of some support to stay there. But this doesn't even do that. This just, you know, yeah, this is where women will be. And, and let me, sorry, let me finish. I might sound a bit. Let me finish with one other thing. The Conditions of Employment Act in 1937 what allowed the Minister of Commerce to, to determine the number of women in a particular um, occupation. And I think just, that just says a lot about what was going on when this was made a part of our constitution. That's not reflective of, of women's lives today. Women are all over the place. They're not in the ways that we want them to be, given the statistics I just talked about. But no, it, 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 it serves no purpose and it maybe does harm. I think, I think leaving it in there would definitely, in the, in the way that it is drafted, would definitely, it is harmful. I mean, referring to woman, um, that we are all the same, that, that there is no difference between any of us and that we're simply um, a function to, to serve within a domestic context. Uh, even though we all do domestic work and we all are involved in care work, but it, it, the entirety of the language and, and its origins, when you look at the history of it as well, um, it, it needs to come out of the constitution in the context in which it is currently written. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of agreement here and I, I'm, I'm agreeing there, but my, my particular um, bugbear with this is the interchangeable nature of the words woman and mother uh, in the uh, constitution. While I'm, I happen to be both, um, I, I don't like the idea that my definition is, you know, woman slash mother interchangeably, you know, am I, am I less woman if I'm not mother, you know, am I only, you know, it just, it's, I find it offensive. To be honest, it's just very opinion. old, yeah. like old views about yeah. women in general. Exactly, absolutely. So I, I think there is, I think there is harm in leaving it there because this is the constitution is is how we frame ourselves, it's how we present ourselves, and it's it's how we see ourselves, and uh, and that's not how I want us to see women. I might just come in and just say something in addition with that. From it's one of the things I said at the start that we probably all read it first a very long time ago, and because it doesn't have any real effect, it hasn't come into our lives in any real way. Well, certainly it's a long time since I first read it in college. So it was when I read it again, I just just shocked that that's that the law of this land says that about me. So and I'm kind of annoyed with myself that I it did bother me for all those years that I've known it was there and was doing no harm because and that's that's how I personally feel about it um, but I think maybe perhaps is the context in which things are raised in college as well that this is an article that hasn't really been useful to yeah. litigate so you kind of look at it you're looking at it from that point of view is it useful or oh, it's not useful and that's how you're you're being trained um, but when you step back from it and you read it and you're like this has a whole other social context to this um, that uh, you really begin to realise how harmful it is. But no, that's a very good point, Denise. Fiona, do we have another question perhaps for the panel? We do, we have a couple more. Uh, just a comment, Aoife Farrelly is rowing in with Denise. I agree with Denise, it takes no account of how we differ as women and our differing roles. But we then also have a question which is really food for thought is reframing the article in a gender neutral manner ignoring the reality of the makeup of who actually performs care work as we have seen from the data if we the society where women perform more care work will amending it to a gender neutral actually affect date -day life for women or even change the attitudes of people in ireland if the article has no teeth it's difficult to imagine a significant symbolic impact particularly where the Irish people have seen referenda with more tangible results. For example, abortion is now legal, gay marriage is now legal. What, what this uh, attendee is wondering is, will amending the language slip through the cracks without significant changes to attitudes? And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I think you definitely, I think reframing the language definitely brings up 
conversation. We're all talking about care today and we're all talking about it in this context and we're all discussing that we're all reading the facts that women are doing more of this and even in COVID-19 when we're all at home supposedly uh, trapped in the same house. Um, so raising the conversation will have to change the way pe people think about it as well um, and, and that's important but I, yes definitely we have a lot of uh, the need to change in legislation and um, having this conversation and not having gone straight through with deleting the provision has meant there's actually a citizens assembly there now um, obviously now that they it's been suspended because of COVID-19 but they are discussing these things and very broad conceptual ideas about how we can change society and how how we can move forward and the more people that discuss this and the more voices we have and that and that's the thing I think suppose traditionally women kind of put up they were doing these things and they didn't even realize that they were doing it and some you know somebody else wasn't they didn't really realize we didn't realize the division of this this labor it's been discussed so much more now we're seeing so many more studies um, that it, that will help to change it and I think it's always start you have to start with a conversation and if we I think if we had gone ahead and deleted this provision, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah, I, I think I, I think there's a lot that I'd agree with there in, in Denise's uh, you know assessment there. But I'm my concern is that I don't like the idea of having something that doesn't work. Doesn't now I'm 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 thieving here from from Anne's you know bring in my constitution and and bang it down on the table and and demand my rights. I. It, it just it seems like a, a sock basically to say that you know here is this you know here is this article here which is going to give you know uh, seems to give protection as it is now to mothers slash women but now we're going to reframe it so that it gives protection to carers and acknowledgement and so on and it almost seems like an insult because I mean if it doesn't give any actual um, you know if there's no if there's no actual applicability if it doesn't work and then, you know, I, I just would feel really um, like, what's the point? You know, I mean, I'd rather we, we had it out and then we had provisions that that in legislation actually give provision to those sort of supports, which absolutely should be there. I, I really feel that that those supports are, are just utterly missing from from society. Well, I just wonder when you take a new when you take the article and we reformulate it and with the social discussion that is ongoing, that this gives it a sense of a kind of a new a new context that perhaps a newly formulated judiciary might actually look at it a bit differently. I mean, what did the state mean by unintended consequences when they decided they needed to delete the provision? Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you, and uh, and I think uh, it might bring us to the uh, the point where Catherine McGuinness's uh, "have a go" notion uh, might be uh, might be due a, a revamp. Here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a small chance, but if it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have uh, Jill asking a question, uh, which will be maybe of interest to all the litigators out there. Can Anne Conlon explain a little more, please, about why Article Forty One Point Two would not be considered worth challenging again? Um, I, I take the point that, you know, sort of being made that one could bring it before the courts again. I, I just think endeavour, the, the fact that the word endeavour is put in weakens it. It is, mm. I use the description and um, I'm not Twiggy, and I use the description of, you know, endeavour is a bit like saying I try to go to the gym, but if we, if I don't get to the gym, we'll all survive. Um, it's not... Endeavour is immediately problematic because nobody can say, but it's black and white, judge, there it is. Um, and I suppose it, that brings me to a point that actually I don't think we've talked about, which is that there is only one socioeconomic right in the Constitution as it stands, and that is the right to a primary school education. Correct me, anyone, if I'm wrong. Typically, the and the courts will not impose economic duties on the state um, I can't think of where they've imposed economic duties on the state in any, you know, there've been various attempts, but never has it, never has a decision not gone appealed and been overturned. So it, it, to, to, sorry, what was the, what was the questions going out of my head? Sorry. But about why I feel it about it's challenging, challenging yeah. again. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's not to say one couldn't, but, and there, there is a truth to say that sometimes courts will, um, you know, court, different courts will take different, different groups of judges will take different attitudes. There, there's no doubt. Um, I suppose we see it with clarity in the United States, but there's an argument to say that it can be clearly seen here at times. Um, 
but I, I think I think it is meaningless as it stands, and I think there'd be great difficulty relying on it in court. And I think any anybody advising a client um, would really be saying to them, "You are absolutely risking your money on this one," um, and, and you know that that um, that you've little chance of success based on the case law. Okay, we have another question coming I'll in. I might be for that opinion later. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jean is wondering if the panel has any view on the impact of COVID-19 in care homes and the future potential increase in importance of permanent home care for elderly incapacitated family members with relation to an amended article 41.2. So I suppose that's around, you know, the, the discussion around should we insert carers, so the repeal versus um, replace and where we possibly, as Cathy touched on just at the start, that COVID-19 has placed a greater emphasis on home and home care, what impact COVID-19 might have on this debate? I don't know if any of the panellists have a view on this. Actually, I, I might just say something on it, and it's it's following on slightly from um, what was said earlier about socioeconomic rights. Um, I suppose to, to go anywhere near what, what, what probably is envisaged in that last comment or question requires some kind of economic support behind it and and Anne has already um, given her view on or on the position as to, in relation to socio-economic backing for constitutional rights my real concern is that we are now in a really really bad economic position and we don't even know the full impact of that and um, it's it's we all know that's coming upon all of us in the very um, short term and I'd be worried about um, the timing to start um, campaigning or advocating for socio-economic rights in the constitution at this stage and I just feel that the the I, I feel that the, the the points can get lost in a different argument in a different sideshow and for me the um that's we've Anne said it in her presentation we've had 10 reports on this article and nothing has happened and there's all these different conversations about all the other things that can happen but right now there it is um on our in our constitution in the same form in the same guise as it was in 1937 while we have all of these other conversations all very important conversations please don't think for a second i'm, I'm suggesting otherwise but um i would be worried about the reality of socio-economic rights being considered properly in the context that we're now in at the moment and i'd be afraid that the other issues would simply get diluted so that the rest of the panel may have other views in relation to that um, question and those points that I've made. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, sorry. Well, I think I would actually consider now is the best time to be bringing these ideas forward. We've just had a fun, the strangest experience I think that possibly any of us have ever lived through. And we're, we're seeing how the world works and how it doesn't work. And that certain things are so incredibly important to our function. And um, we're seeing right now, we definitely need a universal childcare. I mean, there are lots of women who are not going to be able to go back to work if their childcare providers do not open up. We're running a legal clinic at the moment and we're getting co constantly getting these calls, these services. And now is the time to start looking at, at developing them. And I think uh, Hawaii actually has just published their own feminist economic recovery model. And sometimes you have to have great, uh, um, misery or to, to, to just propel change because we've been going along in the same way for an incredibly long time for decades and decades and there hasn't and it's just getting much more difficult for people to live people are working longer hours and they're commuting longer and they're a huge amount of money out in childcare and there just doesn't seem to be any change to that mm. are we now to go back to what it was or should we take this as an opportunity and really start to see how we can actually change our society and how we can have a better one for everyone? And that might mean we might have to pay more taxes, but it might mean that everyone gets more universal services. Like we were told for a very long time, there's nothing, you know, the, the health service has to be divided, you know, it is the way that it is and they'll move slowly towards change. But the minute there was this big catastrophe, they were able to step in and start making changes. They were able to step in and have this um, basic 350 euros for people. They were able to do these things. So it is possible. Um, and I do think it's now is the time really to have the conversation. 
Yeah, no, there's a lot I'd agree with there, Denise. Um, I'm, I'm particularly minded to the um, comparison with, say, post-World uh, War II Britain and the establishment of the welfare state at that time and the massive um, building, uh, you know, housing programme that happened at that time. So I can absolutely agree with you that there is um, the definite potential for kind of uh, times of disaster to be times of, of tr transformative social change so i think we do have uh, it's one of those um, things you know that the chinese word for crisis and opportunity being you know uh, the same yeah. yeah and 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 we are in a crisis and you know and maybe it is an opportunity to reframe how we see our society and, and what sort of a society and um, i i certainly want to go back to a normal i don't necessarily want to go back to the old normal so i like the idea of finding a new normal and uh, and maybe that new normal is a more egalitarian equal society and do you have any view on that one? Uh, no, I'll run on with that. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah Pauline is, is very uh, rightly pointing out in relation to the foundations of Article 41.2, let us not forget the role of the church at that time. Archbishop mm. influence on De Valera was significant and, and Rosemary, maybe you'll... you'll uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, it, like the, whole, the whole Catholic ethos is just running through um, Bunwick Meharan like, like a, you know, it's a thread that goes all the way through it from the preamble all the way through. It's, you know, it, it is the ethos. The only thing, to be honest, that I found almost surprising about Bunwick is that, is that we don't actually have Catholicism as the state religion. Um, I found that quite, quite interesting, actually, because, you know, the church had such in influence and had, um, you know, such um, editorialising, um, and that's why I quoted um, McQuaid um, to show the, the similarity between his direct quote and, and the, the article itself. I mean, he essentially wrote large sections of it um, in, in um, you know, in consultation with, with De Valera. But um, I know that there was a huge push um, from, um, from McQuaid's side to have Catholicism as the state religion. So that's a small pushback, the fact that we don't actually have a state religion. We do have that separation of, uh, of church and state, however tenuous, um, but it is there. But I, I'd absolutely agree with uh, Pauline. It is running through the, the document entirely. And Catherine Ivers is wondering if, it, if Article 41.2 was removed, is it more or less likely that in a judicial separation or divorce that a woman's regarding mother's position would not be as strong? So I suppose you could maybe flesh out that question and say, is there any possible negative consequences of removing Article 41.2, both in the family law arena and, and in other areas? I just, I just go, I probably go back to the case law. And you'd say um, there now is very solid legislation, family law legislation in place. Um, the, you know, the Divorce Act and um, legislation covering judicial separation. So they're very solidly in place. And then the other hand, as I say, uh, you know, there have been so few cases on the topic. I, 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 I don't see I don't see any correlation. The courts certainly haven't led. Um, there's no case law that would lead you to believe there's any correlation. Um, as, as things currently stand. I mean, the L versus L case was, I can't remember the year, but it's, it's pre the, obviously the, the family law legislation. So no, I'd have no, con I, I personally would have no concerns about it. I don't know what any of the other, uh, what anybody else would think on that. No, I'd, 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 yeah, it would appear that it's not useful as it currently stands. I was just going to follow on there on a comment though that you made, Anne, and that is that, um, and I suppose it's just important to, to recognise that some of the things that, that people want, they can be best dealt with in the context of legislation. It may not be that the constitution is the place, and I suppose that's important in, 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 within the conversation that people want to have about really important things we need to do in the country, really important rights we need to put in place for people, um, that, that are active rights that people can rely on. Um, legislation is a really good place for that to happen but in my I suppose the point I was making earlier is that the constitution is not necessarily the place for some of those effective day-to-day -day rights especially if they're not effective and it is simply um, like a dead article like article 41.2 has been but anyway so I just wanted to say that that's not that I'm saying I'm against any of these changes it's just that is there another way to make them in a way that we can actually rely on them that they'll actually work whether it's a statutory instrument or whatever it is thank you and um, Fiona have we anything else there 
Um, no, our, our poll results are in, and I don't know if all our attendees can see the poll results, but if there was a referendum in the morning and uh, our attendees were voting, we would not be uh, removing Article 41 from the Constitution, and that's at 53% no. Um, right. Some of the other answers, do you believe we should replace Article 41.2 with an alternative provision with gender neutral language? That's an 82% yes. Um, if yes, do you believe that any new article should be symbolic and um, less clear cut? 61% said yes. And then finally, if yes, do you believe that such article should include socioeconomic rights? And 89% of uh, voters said yes to that. So uh, just to wrap up, if I could have from maybe all of our panellists, um, if we were all meeting again on the 28th of May 2021, what would you like to have seen happen in the preceding 12 months in respect of Article 41.2? Big one. So we go in order of speaker. So Anne, we'll start. Okay. Um, I would like I would like to see it repealed. Um, I I I fear that my in saying that anyone would think that I'm not in favour of consideration of other proposals. Um, I am. I. I think there are other possibilities, but I, 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 I take the point that um, Cathy made about legislation is sometimes a better place. Um, I think going back to that discussion of unintended consequences and you know what is there to be feared by it, I, I, the difficulty with, with while it can happen with, with legislation, it's far more likely to happen with the constitution that courts interpret it in a way that either wasn't intended or um, they change their position, or I, I, I always think the constitution is somehow more in the power of the courts than it is necessarily the people. Whereas actually, legislation can be far clearer, can be changed more easily, um, which is a good and a bad thing. I appreciate, but so so I would like to see it taken out. I, I'd also like to see other work done. I mean, the point that um, Sinead Gibney made is very well made about forty one um, three. Uh, and and other bits of the constitution and um, it would be lovely to see a, a review of the whole of the constitution in my opinion but for the moment i'd live with taking this out and then i think there's terrific work i mean i thought denise's presentation was super there's such good work going on um in terms of you know women's rights in other areas um and then women you know women also want what's best for society so they want what's best for men um I'm not always convinced that's the other way around. <laughs> Rose? Yeah, I, I like how do you follow that? Um, I am also in favour of uh, removing this, uh, this provision, but then after that, um, you know, having a completely separate, um, uh, you know, uh, conversation about the you know symbolic position of uh, and the role of caring and um, I, I don't like the conflating of the two I think I, I don't like the idea of um, of just you know well we're not, not we're going to make this gender neutral we're going to you know I think that just that the provision itself is just so objectionable I just can't I can't warm to it at all and um, so I'd just like to see it see the end of it entirely but like Anne I would like to see legislation um, as the place where we use to you know to actually have um, socioeconomic rights and so on because I mean, we've, we've no right to housing, we've no right to water, we've no right, and none of these rights are, are in the constitution and there's been really good arguments being made um, if we're to have X right, you know, socioeconomic right, we should have the other and so on. So I, I think really it's a case of taking something offensive like this out of the constitution and then having a separate conversation about what we want our society to be. Denise makes wonderful points regarding, you know, having a single tier health service, having, you know, all of these different things that, that we were told were, were somehow impossible. And now you throw up all the cards in the air and how, where do they fall? And, uh, and they fall into a new society. And, uh, and I really am very, very energized by the idea of us building that new society. I just don't think we're going to build it by, um, by putting, taking one word out and, and putting in a, a, an alternate into, uh, into this provision. So that's where I'm at. Um, I, uh, well, hopefully in a year, a year's time, we will have had a referendum. We will have, um, a uh, new, the article we reformulated, it will have our new gender neutral language, but, um, ideally, yeah, I really would like to see a proper conversation or indeed, you know, socioeconomic rights being put on the table as a real possibility. Um, if we're really talking about pie in the sky thinking, um, I definitely think we should start talking about the four day working week. Um, they're doing it in those New Zealand. Why can't we? We're a small island nation. 
Um, I think that that would be a phenomenal change um, to people's lives. Mm -hmm. And we can have these things if we push for them and if we put it out there in it and we talk about it and we act and we ask for it. And um, if you want more of those kind of pie in the sky ideas about the future, running, if the Women's Council is running a feminist agenda web series at the moment. So please come and check us out. We had one today about the economy and what we what we want from the economy in the future. So there's all those thoughts are happening and um, they'll be coming for weeks to come. And hopefully something really substantive will come out of this. And we're sitting here waiting for this new program for government, whatever it will be, but hopefully they will have some really important new changes for us. Thank you so much, um, Denise. Thank you to Rosemary. Thank you to Anne. Thank you to Fiona for fielding the questions. Um, I suppose I, I, Fiona did ask me, would I like to make a kind of a closing remark in relation to that? Um, I, I've made it clear, I suppose I believe, I would like to see in 12 months time that the article will have been repealed. I would like there to be a separate debate on how we want to treat care in society and whether socioeconomic rights are realistic in the context of our society and our economy. I would like to have that. I really do not want them both to be the same because I don't want to see a blending between an offensive article about women just morphing into something about care. I want them to be separate. I want to stop what has happened all along in terms of how we have been portrayed in the constitution. And then as a society, let's talk about care. So that, that's what I personally would like. But I found this, um, this evening absolutely inspirational. It's been fantastic. Thank you so much to everybody, particular thanks to you, Denise, because yeah. you've come along to, to share your view um, from the National Women's Council of Ireland, and it's been really, really helpful. Um, I'd like to thank all of the participants, all of the people who with their great questions and just for being interested in this important topic. Um, I would like to say to you all that obviously IWLA will be continuing to work and engage on this. A lot of information on our website. If you're not already a member, it would be fantastic if you'd like to go onto the website and consider joining. And I think we have a lot more to talk about in relation to this. Finally, I'd like to thank Maeve Delargy, who's been our IT guru, looking after all of this. And again, back to Fiona McNulty, who not only was helping with the questions, but did a huge amount of work organizing this webinar for us um, this evening. Um, so that's it. Good evening, everyone. And um, thank you very much and stay safe. <laughs>